Hello and welcome to another tutorial video. Now as I record this, I have spent almost the past entire year just working on real estate and REIT related case studies and models. So some of the upcoming videos, including this one, are going to be related to real estate. And in this one, we're going to answer a very common question that we get about valuation, specifically with the net asset value model for real estate investment trusts. And here's the question that we often get about this model. I've looked at examples of net asset value models online and in various articles, but they seem too easy. You revalue the REIT's assets and liabilities, and then you subtract the REIT's liabilities from its assets, and that's the REIT's net asset value. What is so hard about this model? So the short answer to this question is that the basic idea is pretty simple, just like anything else in accounting and finance, really. The difficulty lies in the execution. Just as with a DCF analysis, there are some tricky parts, and Sometimes it can be difficult to come up with reasonable assumptions depending on the type of REIT it is, the geographies it operates in, and the business model that it uses. The net asset value model is mostly about judgment. How much is item X worth? How much is item Y worth? Should item Z be worth more or less than the number shown on the REIT's balance sheet? So in this lesson, we're going to start with the basic idea using a simplified example for Park Hotels, a hotel REIT, and then we'll show you two more complex examples, one for Avalon Bay, a multifamily REIT, and one for Digital Realty, a data center REIT, and use these examples to illustrate why the analysis can be more complicated than it seems at first glance. Here's the basic idea behind a NAV model. A REIT's properties are recorded at historical cost minus accumulated depreciation on the balance sheet. But unlike factories and equipment that wear down and need to be replaced over time, buildings and land tend to rise in value, tend to appreciate over the long term. So the book value of a property on the balance sheet tends to dramatically understate its fair market value. Now, this whole concept really only applies to US-based REITs because REITs that follow IFRS, whether they're in Canada or Europe or Asia or Australia or other places, do mark their properties to fair market value. So the NAV model is far less useful there. You might see a few minor adjustments, but you're generally not going to see anything massive. And in those cases, you can often use the book value of the REIT as a pretty good proxy for net asset value. So everything that we're going to cover here really just applies to US-based REITs that follow US GAAP for the most part. Here's an example of how you actually execute this analysis using park hotels. The first thing you have to do is project the forward net operating income, the operating income from the REIT's properties, and then divide it by an appropriate cap rate or yield to revalue the real estate assets and figure out what they're actually worth. If we go into the Excel model here for Park Hotels, we can see an example of it right here. I have the net asset value on screen, I have the adjusted values over on the left-hand side, and then I have the values on the company's historical balance sheet on the right-hand side and the difference as a percentage over here in the right-hand most column. So here on the balance sheet, the net real estate assets are listed at about 8.3 billion. The forward NOI from those assets is about 838 million. We use a cap rate of 7.5%. The lower the cap rate, the more valuable the property. The higher the cap rate, the less valuable the property. We take that 838, divide by the 7.5%, and so we get to a market value of about 11.1 .1 or 11.2 billion for the company's real estate operating assets, which is significantly higher than the book value, higher by about 34% according to this. So that's the first and most important step of this analysis. Now, once you have revalued the real estate operating assets of the REIT, then you have to value the other assets. Typically, you'll assume a small premium for the construction in progress. You will set goodwill and intangible assets to zero, and the rest of the assets should generally stay about the same. So here, we take the REIT's construction in progress. We apply a modest 20% markup to it, so it goes from 79 to 95. We keep cash and cash equivalents and accounts receivable the same, and then goodwill is about 648 million, but we just adjust that to zero because this is worthless. We cannot sell it to anyone else. It's only worth something to us. So this simply goes to zero and you apply the same to any type of intangible asset that the REIT has. And then other assets is also stays the same. Once we have all that, we can add up the market value of all these assets. We get to around 11.9 billion versus only 9.7 billion on the REIT's historical balance sheet. So this is why it's so important for US based REITs because of that big difference caused by not marking properties to market value. For an IFRS based REIT, there would still be some difference here, but it would be much smaller. It might be a difference of 2%, 3%, something in that range maybe. Once you've done all that, then you adjust the liabilities. 
The main adjustment here is to take the fair market value of the debt, especially if interest rates or credit risk have changed. So here, for example, we adjust upward the value of the company's debt by about 0.5%, because since the time the company's main tranche of debt was issued, interest rates have fallen. Therefore, this company's debt is now worth more than it was when it was first issued, simply because investors cannot get the same types of interest rates anymore. They've fallen since its original issuance. We keep the rest of the liabilities like accounts payable, other liabilities, non-controlling interests here the same. And then once we have all that, we subtract the adjusted liabilities from the adjusted assets to calculate net asset value and then net asset value per share. And you can see that down here. Net asset value is just our total market value of assets. And then we subtract the market value of debt and other borrowings, the market values of all the other liabilities, and we get to net asset value. We divide it by the company's share count up at the top. And then we can compare that to their current share price and see that right now, their net asset value per share is above their current share price, meaning that the company could be slightly undervalued. That's what this analysis implies. Now, it's not a huge differential. It might be, say, a 5 to 10% difference here. But these numbers show that this particular company, if we believe our assumptions, is slightly undervalued at the moment. So that's the basic idea behind a NAV model. Now we're going to get into the reasons why they can get more complex and why it's not quite as simple as what I just showed you. The first problem is how do you project the forward NOI? And do you need to adjust it for replacement reserves, non-cash items, acquisitions, dispositions in the quarter, something like that? Here, we kind of glossed over it because we had this number from another operating model for this company in segment by segment projections, but you'd have to really think about how to get that number in real life. Next, you have to think about how you handle the REIT's acquisition, development, redevelopment, and disposition activity. Here, again, we glossed over it because it's already factored into this forward NOI estimate, but in a lot of cases, you're not going to have detailed projections for the REIT, so you really have to think about how to factor in the additional NOI from these items and also the additional costs associated with acquisitions and developments and redevelopments, for example. The third complication is that you have to think about how you pick the cap rate or the range of cap rates to use. Now, the analysis is extremely sensitive to the cap rate estimate that you pick. Even going from something like 7.5% to 6.5% makes a pretty massive difference. With that assumption, 6.5% instead, now the REIT looks like it might be around 40% undervalued. So this analysis is highly sensitive to what you pick for the cap rate or the range of cap rates, and you have to think about how to do that in more detail. And then the fourth complication is how you handle joint ventures. In other words, projects where the REIT owns less than 50% or sometimes slightly more than that, but some number that is significantly less than 100%. Often these represent ownership percentages between 20% and 50%. The issue with these is that the debt associated with them does not appear directly on the balance sheet. You only see part of this item on the balance sheet under equity investments on the asset side, so you have to think about how to revalue these and reflect them properly in the analysis. Now, the way you deal with these in order is the following. For the forward NOI, often you just annualize the most recent quarter's NOI, you adjust for non-cash items, you assume a growth rate, or you could do what we did in a few of these and create segment level projections and use them instead. So if you have really detailed projections, you may not need to annualize anything and make all these adjustments. For acquisitions, developments, dispositions, and redevelopments, you could make detailed projections, or you could just adjust the most recent quarter's NOI for these items, and then reflect the cost of realizing some of these in the assets and liabilities. With cap rates, you often use brokerage firms like Jones Lang LaSalle and their data. You could Google a lot of this. Search for something like Data Center REIT Cap Rates New York, or Multifamily Cap Rates Seattle, and you can find a lot of this information. And then for the joint venture assets and liabilities, you have to separate these out. Because of the way accounting works under both IFRS and US GAAP, actually, you have to separate these, you have to revalue them, and then you have to multiply the newly revalued assets and liabilities by the ownership percentages and, and count them on both sides of the NAV analysis. So let's go to an example now for Avalon Bay and take a look at what we do for their NAV model. I'll go to the second tab in the spreadsheet, the AVB NAV one. For the forward NOI, we built projections for the six established same store segments, and then we forecast NOI from other activities, and we deducted replacement reserves from all of this. We have reason to believe that the company was not counting fully the replacement reserves within its NOI estimates, so we actually created an additional deduction for it. 
And you can see it here. We have NOI for New England, New York, New Jersey, Mid-Atlantic, Pacific Northwest, Northern and Southern California, development, redevelopment, and acquired properties. And we pick cap rates for all these and we use them to get to the implied value in each segment right here. Now for the acquisitions, developments, and dispositions, we projected the NOI directly from all these. So we count them like that in this analysis. And then to make sure that we are not double counting anything here, with the construction and progress, it's actually a much higher number on the company's balance sheet. It's around 1.3 billion. However, we don't wanna double count assets here. So we actually subtract the value of the assets that are associated with the new developments and redevelopments here, the 700 million and the 80.7 million. And that way we reflect the fact that there will be some NOI coming from this spending, but we don't wanna count both the NOI from this and capitalize it and also count the book value of those assets on the balance sheet. So that is how we're dealing with this one here. And then for the cap rates, we use Jones-Ling LaSalle data for class A properties in different geographies as of the time of this valuation. So for example, we just did a Google search for this and found that in Seattle, the multifamily cap rate was around four to 4.6%. 4 so we picked around 4.3% for the Pacific Northwest right here. And then if you go down for the San Francisco Bay area, it was 4% to 4.5%. And so for Northern California, we went 4.5% because many of the company's properties are actually outside of the city proper. And we went through and did something like that for all of these. And then for joint venture assets and liabilities, we created a mini projection for these. We capped the NOI multiplied by Avalon Bay's ownership. And then we adjusted the GV assets, debt and other liabilities and multiplied by their ownership again. So for the equity investments, the joint ventures here, we have the NOI of 65 million. We capped it at 5%, which gave us a value of 1.2 billion. Avalon Bay owns 25% of these. And so the market value of this is around 310 million, which is quite a bit higher than what's shown in the balance sheet. Then we factor in the other JV assets right here. And again, multiplied by the ownership percentage. On the other side, we have joint venture debt and other joint venture liabilities. And we did the same thing there. We just adjusted these to fair market value. We multiplied by the ownership percentage and that's how we got to the values for those. Now, the rest of this analysis is pretty standard and straightforward. We marked the debt to market value. We factored in some of the tax benefit from some of the bonds, which we're not gonna get into right here, right now. We slightly marked up the value of the construction and progress. The company also had some income from management development and other fees. And so we applied a much higher cap rate or a much lower multiple to that to get the capitalized value of that one. And then once we had all that to get to net asset value at the bottom, once again, we took the total market value of assets and then we subtracted the total market value of all the applicable liabilities right here. And then once again, as with Park Hotels, it seems like Avalon Bay at the time of this analysis might have been slightly undervalued by the market with a NAV per share of 182 versus a current share price of around 165. So that's one example. Now, another example here is for digital realty. This is a data center REIT. With this one for the forward NOI, we took a different approach because we didn't have detailed projections. So we annualized the most recent quarter's NOI. We adjusted for some non-cash items, dispositions and new developments and assumed a growth rate over the next 12 months. So if you go over to the DLR NAV tab over here, you can see what I've done. We have the NOI 346.5 million. So I multiplied by four. We have some straight lining of rent and other expenses. We have above and below market rent amortization. These are both non-cash items that affect the REIT's net operating income. So we make adjustments for these. Then we also adjust for the NOI associated with properties we disposed of in this quarter. And then the NOI that came online as a result of properties being finalized and going into the market in this quarter. And we got to the consolidated cash NOI like that. We estimated a 4% growth rate over the next 12 months and that gave us our forward cash NOI. For acquisitions, developments, and dispositions here, we dealt with it in a very simple way. We just subtracted the lost NOI from dispositions, and then we added the NOI primarily from developments here, but maybe also a little bit from redevelopments and acquisitions. So we just factored those into the NOI and also accounted for them in our growth rate because we picked a slightly lower growth rate than we would have if we had not included those items already. Also here, we have this item investment associated with backlog. So we actually subtract out the value of these assets that are coming online so that we're only counting the NOI from these assets and we're not double counting it. We're not 
both including the NOI and then also including the asset value. We're subtracting them from the construction in progress right here. We also have this item for pre-stabilized inventory at cost, which is associated with it. And we have the cost to complete backlog assets down here as well. So we are factoring in the cost of completing these types of items. Now for the cap rates, we just Googled for data center cap rates across the country. And we found a couple different sources on this. There's this one item for North American data centers and the newsletter here, and they disclose a lot of these cap rates. They say a 6.67% cap rate, they have a 6.5%, a 7% cap rate, a 6.5% cap rate, a 7.4% cap rate. So we found a lot of the numbers like that. If you look in other sources, they will tell you that around this point in time, many of these data center REITs had cap rates in the 6.5% to 7.25% range if they have longer term leases, which Digital Realty does. And so we got to our 6.6% estimate and our 7% estimate for the equity investment or joint venture NOI based on those numbers. And then finally, for the joint venture assets and liabilities, we didn't make separate projections in this case. We just took the company's disclosures at face value and used the numbers in their quarterly reports. What I mean by that is that they issue quarterly financial supplements. And so they disclose items here, such as the total unconsolidated cash annual NOI annualized. This is their cash NOI from their joint ventures. And so we just took this number as is. And they also disclose the pre-stabilized inventory. They disclose the pro rata portion of the joint venture debt here as well. So we just took the numbers from their disclosures in this case and went with them. The company tends not to give away quite as much information as Avalon betas, partially because they're smaller. So in this case, we just went with their numbers and didn't try to dig into them in too much more detail. Once again, at the end, we get to net asset value by taking the total market value of tangible assets and subtracting the market values of all the liabilities here. And in this case, the company actually seems overvalued because the NAV per share is around 97, but the current share price at this point in time was around 118. Now, the question comes up of which of these approaches is the best one to use in your own models and case studies. The first question you have to ask is how much time and energy can you devote to the analysis and how important is it? And then the second question you have to ask is how much data do you have? Can you actually find cap rates by region? Can you determine what the cap rates in the different business segments are? You have to ask those types of questions and see what's available and how much in terms of resources you also have available. For a quick analysis without much data, the digital realty approach is better because you don't need to make detailed projections. You don't need cap rates by region or anything like that. You can make some very, very rough, quick estimates and rely more on the company's own data. If it's a more in-depth analysis and you have more data, the Avalon Bay approach is better because property values do differ significantly by region, even within similar areas like the coastal US. And if you want to see an example of that, just go back and take a look at the NAV model here. We have cap rates that go from 4.2% to 5.3%. Now that may seem like a small difference, but keep in mind that in terms of multiples, a cap rate of 4.2% is about a 23.8x multiple, and a cap rate of 5.3% is about an 18 or 19x multiple. Maybe not a huge difference, but a pretty substantial difference that you do want to take into account in this type of analysis. We're at the end, so let's do a quick recap and summary now. In part one, we went through the basic idea behind a net asset value model using the Park Hotels example. You simply project the forward NOI, select the appropriate cap rate, and use that to get to the market value of the real estate assets. You revalue the other assets, taking intangibles and goodwill to zero, and sometimes assuming a slight markup to the others. And then you mark the debt to fair market value, you may revalue the other liabilities slightly, but you'll leave many of them alone. And then you subtract the liabilities from the assets to calculate the net asset value. Then you can look at net asset value per share and compare it to the company's current share price. NAV models can get more complex because you have to think about how to project forward NOI in more detail. You have to factor in acquisitions, developments, redevelopments, and disposition activity. You have to think more about the cap rates or range of cap rates you're going to use. And you have to think about the treatment of equity investments or joint ventures. And then finally, we went through two more complex net asset value examples for Avalon Bay and Digital Realty. Avalon Bay was a lot more complex and involved projecting different business segments, using different cap rates, using different cap rates for different geographies and different business segments, but it's probably a little more accurate when all is said and done. Digital Realty was simpler and didn't involve making detailed projections. It just involved making some pretty simple estimates, actually. It's a little bit less precise, but it's still reasonably good, especially if you don't have much time 
or information to complete the analysis. That's it for a quick tutorial on net asset value model for real estate investment trusts. Hopefully now you know a little bit more about how this analysis works and what can make it trickier than it seems at first glance.